Jamie, Merry Christmas. Hi, Merry Christmas, you guys. Okay, so we are just so happy because I feel like we have a new friend. We were just chatting before <laughs> before we got on. And I think we could talk to you all day. I really do. Same, same. We <laughs> covered things from children to winter sports. You know, we really kind of <laughs> ran the gamut. Yeah. We talked about you running into a bunch of skis. That was, that was a sweet little, um... I, I took out an entire outdoor cafe and it's fine. I've never been back on the slope since, mm -hmm. um, mostly cause I got fired from that, uh, sport. Everyone, they were like, listen, if a Jamie Nato ever comes here, you just tell her <laughs> no, like we choose life. We choose safety. I'm sure the people that you took on all their skis really appreciated that. I'm sure they loved it. I did that. And then I felt so bad. I didn't even look back. Like I just gently grabbed what I could of my yard <laughs> sale and left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that seems appropriate. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are you going to do? Put them all back? No, that's, that's... <laughs> just, they didn't want me back up there anyway. So, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Jamie, we are going to go from the slopes straight into <laughs> straight into grief because that's how it goes around here um, <laughs> on true. the podcast is this is how we roll. And uh, 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 oops, sorry about that. I just had a little technical problem. Um, so Jamie, we, we know that a lot of people around this time of year are navigating grief and it is holidays are a trigger for grief mm. because they remind us of either what we lost or what we thought would be that isn't, or it's just such a time of, it's just such a nostalgic sentimental time yeah. and to have something hard enter into that story of the holidays. Yeah feels like a disruption. It feels like, what are you doing here? This is supposed to be a time of love, joy, warmth, kindness, mm. goodness, and the, you aren't welcome. And so can you just share a little bit about how grief has played into your story and your life around the holidays? Yeah, it is so complicated. I The story of infidelity is part of our marriage and this was, I don't even, 15 years ago, and I could be wrong about that. It was, it was a while ago, but when that happened, it happened in between Thanksgiving and the new year, like mm -hmm. the most joyful, happiest time I was walking through one of the most miserable times in my life. And to the point where I would go to bed at night and, and not that I wanted to die, but I, it was just so gut wrenching that I prayed, mm -hmm. you know, God, if I do die, I think it would be okay. If mm -hmm. you just take me in the night, like you're just in the worst place. And so I, my world fell apart. Now we got through that season. It, it, it was miraculous. God did save our marriage. It's a really long story, but it, it did that, that God, really entered into our life and he, he changed us and he changed my husband and he changed me and just our whole life by a miracle. Okay. That is a Christmas miracle, but what did not go away. And what I didn't understand was the holidays would come back around the next year and the mm -hmm. next year and the next year. And my body would just, I would be sad. I wouldn't, and I couldn't put a finger on it. Why am I not being happy when we're decorating the tree? And I am like, I can't even put an ornament on the tree. I felt kind of paralyzed in it. It was like, everything was happy going around me, the happiest music. And as soon as that like cold, you know, when you turn a corner and the wind just hits so hard, so much harder than you <laughs> expected, and it just felt like it slapped me every Christmas for a long time. And uh, it was just devastating. I thought, why is it so sad around this time when we're, we're even like in a better place? We're even like God is doing this incredible work and still is. But I am sad. I mean, it was mm. in the contrast of the holidays. It was just 
it was a lot to um, try to understand. And I think for about two years, I did not, I did not place that the holidays were sad for me because I had experienced trauma, you know, the years Mm -hmm. before. So. Yeah. It seems like that's very relatable for people, no matter the circumstances and whether it's something that happened during the holidays, which for you, that's Mm -hmm. acute because all of those symbols and time of year and visuals and smells and flavors and everything would take you back to that hard place. Mm -hmm. But even for somebody who's experienced something hard any time of year, as Krista said, the holiday season kind of brings that forward because of expectations. The holidays just bring these huge expectations. Mm -hmm. So how did you maneuver through that? Because I think people can relate to that. I can't hang, I can't, I can't hang up an ornament. I can't do it. With the responsibility you might have felt as a mom or as someone who was making Christmas happen for other people or Thanksgiving or whatever New Year's happen that you would balance that, or maybe there's no balance. How did you approach that? I guess, or, and, and what have you learned? Yeah, I think I wish I would have been more compassionate with myself. If I could go back, I wish I would have said, of course you're sad, but Mm -hmm. I think there was a lot of like snap out of it. Like make this so happy for your kids, or it is the happiest time of the year. Like you can be happy for this day. And I, when, and I just couldn't, so that was unrealistic, you know, talk about unrealistic expectations, but I had one for myself and just, I wish I would have been more compassionate to say, of course you are, are sad right now. And I wish I would have had someone say like, it is really sad and heavy right now, but it is not going to be like this forever. It's not, it cannot rain forever. And I think when I say that some people there, I get pushed back for that. Like, don't tell me it's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not saying it's, it's all going to be perfect, but I am saying it as you work through your grief and as you work through your trials and as you work through this with God there, we are a people marked by hope and he does come down to us and he does intervene for us. And even in our groanings, I mean, to tell you when I was praying and I didn't have words and it was groans and God met me in that moment. And in those times. Um, and so I think, you know, having some compassion for yourself, you know, we don't have to rush out of grief. And, um, I live with a lot of shame. I think, I don't know if anybody has ADHD, but my brain is already working very differently. And I I live with shame. Like, why can't you just be like everyone else. Why can't you just get it together? And so that kind of voice lives with me. You know, why can't you just be happy? And, and now I'm much more gentle with myself and I'm much more compassionate. And I know that sounds like, Oh, that's not really a helpful tip and trick, but I think it has to start with you being compassionate with yourself and, and affirming like, this is hard. And this feels hard because it is hard. So just Like that is sad. Like what happened to you or what is happening to you is sad. And you're going to have this huge contrast of the holidays and it's, it's just make it amplifies it. But there is something also about, you know, practically, I would say verbalizing it, telling a friend how hard it is. I think there was a part of me that thought, well, I can't ruin their holiday. And Mm. If my friend ever came to me with something hard, even it could be on Christmas day. I, that doesn't even cross my mind. I am more like, tell me more. I'm so sorry. Like, how how can I help you today? Like no one's thinking that. (laughs) Think you think they think, you know, uh, it was such a joy killer. And really, um, that's the thing that's going to help you maneuver a difficult time is saying, uh, I need to just get this out. I need to get it into the light so that it doesn't have power over me and let someone shoulder, shoulder that with you. So practically 
be gentle with yourself, but practically talk about it. You, some people can't afford a therapist. I understand, but you have a best friend and you, you have got to talk to someone. Do I recommend therapy? Like 10 out of 10 stars. You want to give yourself a Christmas gift? <laughs> there it is. Pay someone to sit and help you unload. Totally. hundred percent. Yes. On that therapy is a Christmas gift that is yes. going on the gift list. You know, it's interesting you say that just today, I had two friends this morning reach out to me and say, Hey, I just need 15 minutes today. Can we just chat really quickly? I need to pray with you, or I need to I need to talk to you real quick about something. And I was seriously so happy that they reached out and said that yeah. and just said, I need you today. So I know, you know, I know you're busy. You've got a lot of stuff going on, but I get, give me 15 minutes. And I'm like, are you kidding? You can have more than 15 minutes. Yes. I'm, I'm here for you. And yeah. yet how often I just was thinking about it. How often do we not do that? Mm -hmm. Do we not just reach out and say, Hey, I need you today. Even if it's just 15 minutes, I need you today. That is so yeah. powerful. And it's an honor. I just put yourself in that position. It's an honor when my friend is trusting me and confiding in me, that's what friends do. And mm -hmm. so it's an honor for me. Of course, your friend is going to think it's an honor for them to shoulder some of that with you. And it's powerful. And it is the embodiment of, of Christ. You think about Christmas, you think about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are a community. It is just built in to us to live in community, um, you know, all that we language and we, we reflect the image of God when we live inside community and it, we're just not meant to be one. We're just not meant to be one person. It's so true. And I mean, I was just thinking about, I mean, truly my response was it's my joy. Like it is my joy. Mm -hmm. And yet what we often think we're burdening, um, but and I also, I, I've said this to my friends too, and I'm wondering if you, if you have any wisdom on this, but I've said to my friends too, I will never get tired of you talking to me about the same things over and over. Like if there's never. something hard and big, like just know I'm never going to get tired of it. You can keep talking mm -hmm. to me about that. Mm -hmm. So what was that like for you as you know, things kept coming up? How did you kind of overcome that obstacle? You know, I mean, I can think of... I can think of so many specific things like grief uh, shows up when it wants, right? There's, you don't get to pick the like time when it comes to you. But I remember there was a time where I would walk through the hallway and in our family pictures, and, and ironically, the family pictures were at like a Christmas tree farm. And my husband is wearing this watch that he received from this woman. And it is in our family photos, like forever you know, and there's a newborn and there is a toddler and there is me and my husband and we're laughing and it just looks picture perfect. And I have these pictures up in my hallway and I am walking past it. And I swear, I mean, I wanted to throw those pictures across the room. Finally, I stopped myself in the hallway and I am talking to the pictures like a crazy person. Cause you know what, when you're grieving, it's just a free pass. You can be a crazy person <laughs> for a bit. And I just said, no, I forgive. I forgive you. I forgive you for the watch. I forgive you for the watch. And you are done chasing me. Like I, mm -hmm. I am done. I forgive you. And when I walk past that photo, you know, the rest of the, my days, my days are back and forth in the hallway, you know, I'm going to that nursery back and forth. Mm -hmm. And I have to pass that picture and that picture taunted me still. But every time I passed it, I said, nope, I already forgave you for that. Like I already, you know, I already did this. I forgive you. And then eventually, eventually by the 800th time you walk past it and that picture doesn't have any more power over you. But I remember telling that to my friend, I thought I was crazy. You know, I think I'm crazy and I'm already just so sad and devastated. And I'm telling this to my friends and they are mirroring back to me. They are saying like this is the spirit of God living in you. You are forgiving. Like this is the fruit of the spirit. This mm. is good. And 
you know it's good because you're like processing and you're trying to do it but for to have someone affirm in you the the spirit of god that's living in you you say yes it is good i needed to hear that because now it gives me even more encouragement Mm -hmm. to go to go find the other things that i need to forgive because there were a million at that point you know just so much trust had been broken and they would say keep going like this is the way you know just kind of Mm. cheering you on but if I had done that alone, I, I think I might've lost some steam and mm-hmm. just saying, I'm tired of forgiving. And, mm-hmm. and even if you are tired of forgiving and you say that to the friend, they say, of course you are, of course you are. And we're going to pick it back up tomorrow. You know, like it's hard to forgive. They were just very encouraging and affirming and like, yes, this is the direction. This is, this is the way to keep going. Mm-hmm. You posted something recently about your sister and her addiction and yeah. how there had been years of her being absent from your family. Yeah. I would assume that during the holidays, those pain points would come up for you and just your greater family constellation. How did you handle that as maybe it wasn't something that was directly your own hurt? but someone mm-hmm. you loved was hurting so deeply and it was impacting other people. I assume that you love and impacting you. Right. How did you manage that as someone who was one step away from the pain, but yet still very close to it? Yeah. Well, and just because they're not there doesn't mean they aren't there. I mean, it's, you just, they're everywhere, especially a person who you feel like is, dead but they're still alive they're walking around the planet somewhere of course you have no idea where uh and so it's just it's sad and there are times and you're watching your kids and or her kids and they're opening their presents and then and then it's joyful and you're holding both Mm -hmm. and saying how do I make sense of this how do I make sense of this and it's just um I think we talk about it. I think that was helpful. I um, am thankful to be a part of a family where we talk about things. And Mm -hmm. so it would be like, is Maggie coming? She, her stories, she gave me permission to talk about her story. Um, You know, is Maggie coming? And my mom would say, yes, but you know, sometimes she shows up and sometimes she doesn't. And I guess you learn to live in the tension of it and not having a solution. And I think the thing about Christmas is the story of hope. We still never stopped hoping for her. I mean, it's tempting to not hope, but I think the Christmas story begs us to keep hoping. It might not turn out like we think, but I think I'd rather live in a place of hopefulness than a place of despair any day. And maybe, you know, it's like hope deferred makes the heart sick. I get that. I get that. But I, I think something that made me be able to get through the grief is to say, you know, if God can come down as a human child, save the world through this miraculous Mary teenager, then maybe he can mm-hmm. heal my sister and maybe he can show up for her in this way. I, and boy, did I pray that I prayed it for her while she was in jail. I prayed it for her. I, when we didn't know where she was, uh, you know, it, I couldn't bring her home because they, you can't reason with an addict, but I knew that I had something more powerful. And that was, I can't go horizontal with this. I Mm -hmm. have to go vertical with this. And if there's anything that living with an addict teaches you, it's, all you have is this vertical you you have no power you have no power you have no control and all I can do is go to the throne of God and beg him to intercede uh for my sister and he did she is so she's been sober um since February last Mm, February and it's a miracle it's because we're talking fentanyl we're talking meth it's Uh. not like gentle gentle drugs so um it's just been a miracle. And, and some people say, how can you talk about it? And how can you so publicly celebrate it? And I am like, guys, 
if you only knew. And also, I if she relapses again, I guess we'll take that. I can't think like that. I cannot mm-hmm. think like that. I have to just love her right here today and celebrate that she came home, even if it's for a little bit. That's so interesting because I have the opposite response. I'm like from the rooftops, like (laughs) shout it from the rooftops that she is sober. Right. Because that's such a win. I mean, oh yeah, that's interesting. It's a win. It's a win because my sister was dying. Yep. Like that's a win. She was resurrected. So of course I'm going to go tell the world. Yeah. But it's a win because by me yelling it from the rooftops, like I do have influence, but by me yelling it from the rooftops, many, many people look to God mm. because they know, they know <laughs> there's no digging out of that. If you live, if you have an addict in your life, you know, there's no digging them out of it and it takes a miracle. So all I'm doing is saying like, it's not even a testament to my sister. It's a testament to God. He, Mm -hmm. he saved my sister. And that is like what you see in the Bible. Like if you see a miracle it's written about, and we, we proclaim that miracle over and over and over again. That's what the scriptures are. We remember the stories. Right. And so, Mm -hmm. so I write about it and I talk about it because I want to remember this story and I want other people to say, what must her God be like? Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, and I was just going to say the world of addiction, people sometimes do relapse, right? It it does for sure happen. And so that's where I think that hesitation of celebration comes mm-hmm. and recognizing we can't predict what next week, next month, next year holds. Mm-hmm. So we can either live in that doomsday element of it's possible. Well, sure, it's possible. But also, what else is possible? And that's what I hear you saying is I'm choosing to believe the other side of what's possible. Mm -hmm. And and I just want to speak to people that right now may have someone who is relapsing to -hmm. know that that is not today is not the end of someone's story, Mm -hmm. that that there can be hope for tomorrow. And we do have to walk. This is the the life of being human Mm -hmm. is that we walk in the midst of brokenness and Mm -hmm. the world as it shouldn't be rather than the way that it should be. And we can look for God in it. And so if you are feeling that discouragement today because you love someone who has done that roller coaster Mm -hmm. to remember that God is here in it and he's going to be here tomorrow and the next day yeah. and the next day and that the hope is there and he's with you now. And it sounds like you recognized that as you cried out on your sister's behalf. Well, we're told to pray. We, we pray, you know, our father, uh, we pray that prayer. And in that it says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done Mm -hmm. on earth as it is in heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven like? It is perfect, right? The kingdom of heaven is like where all things are made right. Justice, um, like mercy, uh, like love. There are no wars. There are no addictions. Like it's perfect. And we are told to pray for those little glimpses of perfection on earth. I, when I thought about that, when I learned about that, I just said that, well, that's what I'm going to pray for then. Like we are told to pray like this and I'm going to pray for this. Bring your perfection down, bring your healing down, bring, uh, give us a glimpse of your kingdom. And, and yes, prayers do not get answered all the time. That, that does happen, but I know that he is working it. He will work it for good. He will do it. And, and that's the hope that I cling to, because if you cling to the hope of an outcome, like my sister getting sober or Mm -hmm. my husband coming back to me or my job is amazing now or whatever you're praying for um, a breakthrough. And if you cling to the outcome, that is a roller coaster for you. That is not going Mm -hmm. to, you're going to be riding that roller coaster. It it will not satisfy you. And so we go vertically, we go to the peace as a person. You want peace, then go to the person of Jesus Christ. And so that's what I'm clinging to. Not, yeah. you know, the outcome of, will my husband come back to me? It, no, it's, I'm with God. I'm mm. with God. 
and his peace is living in my heart. And that is what I'm going to cling to. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was just writing about this. I was just writing about Shalom yesterday and what Shalom means. And it means that complete fullness and wholeness, this holistic completeness because of what God has done, not because of what we have done or yeah, it's, it's apart from circumstances. It's above circumstances. Yeah. And because of that peace is found here. I love that you said that peace is a person because peace is found in here. It is not found mm-hmm. out there. We certainly see mm-hmm. that in the world right now. I mean, the world is, there's no semblance of peace. So mm-hmm. peace has to be beyond the world. It is, it is in Christ. It is that rootedness yeah. in Christ. You know, it's interesting. Um, one of the things that really spoke to me in that post, your post about your sister also was that she was telling people about God, even while she was struggling in yes. her addiction. And one of the things I want to talk about, um, is this idea that God is still reaching people yeah. even in the midst of brokenness. Ooh. And so can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think, unfortunately, and I was raised like this too. It's like, God loves you no matter what, but we still want you to be a good little girl, but here's a million other rules you need to follow. Um, and also we like you more if you follow them and Mm -hmm. you, you know, you, you just, you get more accolades also if you follow them. And so you grow up and it's verbally our theology is like, God uses whoever he wants. He uses the weak and he comes for the sick. (laughs) And then functionally, our functional theology is like, I better do good things for God. And if I do good things for him and I behave, he is going to use me and I'm going to be used for God. And, um, and also he's going to give me blessings. So Mm -hmm. that is just, it's so true. It's (laughs) just how we live. Like we have these formulas Mm -hmm. and then when God doesn't, play safe in our formula, like AKA my marriage. I was a good Christian girl. I waited to have sex till I was married. I, we were both going to church and we were in small groups. We were volunteering. We are, you know, a plus Christians (laughs) and you do all these things in the formula. And then it equals like a really happy marriage. Mm -hmm. And I was miserable. So where God, do you not love me? Like, do you Mm -hmm. not see that I obeyed you and you were supposed to. And we do that. We use God. Like he's a genie in a bottle and say like, I do this for you. You do this for me. And and God is too, he does not work like that. He's too mysterious. Mm. But to that end, you know, you think about what are we after when we have a relationship with God? What does it look like when we have this relationship with God? Is it performative? Or does he just want to be with me in wherever I'm at? In seminary, um, our teacher gave us a case study. And um, I'm reading the case study like a good little student. And I'm saying, okay, we have to solve this problem. Well, what would Jesus do? In my head, I'm thinking, what would Jesus do? Because I am a child of the 90s evangelicals. Mm -hmm. And we just, the bracelets. bracelets. Forget Taylor Swift. We had the WWJDs. We have the bracelet. And, um, And there was a part in the case study where it said, when people are looking at other people like solutions, like they are problems that need solutions, um, we are asking, what would Jesus do? And we are not asking, where is Jesus at? Mm. And it spanked me, a little theological spanking. And I, yeah, you guys can make shirts with that on it later. Um, And it, it begs you to ask, where is God at and where is he working? And God was in a jail cell with my sister, um, detoxing and miserable. And she is telling her cellmates about Jesus. God, while my sister was high at a drug house, had been on drugs for days, is telling people they must know who Jesus is. That is hard for Christians. And I think, especially in evangelical spaces, because you, you need to have 
some semblance of like put togetherness and to have someone proclaiming God who is still very much stuck in their sin. And I, and at some point I think we need to have a more compassionate view of addiction as in they are stuck in a disease actually. And he is using my sister and the things of the world and the things that are the most you guys having my sister around, especially during this time was just like, she's in a hollow shell. Right. Mm -hmm. But there would be sometimes Maggie would come to be with us Mm -hmm. and you would just live for those moments, right? Like there's my sister. Mm -hmm. And I think that is just like, her on drugs too. There were, there are sometimes God breaks through that hollow shell and says, I will be proclaimed neither death nor life, nor meth, nor fentanyl, nor Mm. sin is going to keep me from being proclaimed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's not really an, even if it's because of Mm. It's because yeah. of our broken state that we can proclaim. And doesn't it have so much more power when somebody who has really been through something or even more is still in the middle of it yeah. and is proclaiming it that we, um, that the impact is greater for those who do not yet believe. Mm-hmm. And, and I agree with you that for so many of us that have been walking in a knowledge of Christ, which often means walking in a culture of Christianity, Mm -hmm. which can be two different things. (laughs) Can't sometimes, sometimes they feel uh, symbiotic and sometimes they feel like, wait, this doesn't quite feel like it all goes together. We can start to not have eyes to see what is really of Christ and what is really of the culture that we live in. And by culture, I mean, even the church culture, the Christian culture, and we all have our own subcultures that we're part of even within that. So I, I do celebrate when I hear somebody struggling who at the same time is saying, and God is here with me because I don't want, I don't want people to suffer, but I also want truth to be told in a way that is heard. And I will say, I think people who are hurting and speaking about God's grace and love at the same time, pack a certain punch in their evangelism because they are speaking out of real gritty experience in the moment. Yeah, it was, it's powerful for me to think about. And, and it, and it makes me look at my own brokenness and my own humanity of just, this is, we are constantly broken, but we like to say like, well, I am, but not like that. Mm -hmm. And the truth is it's a lot like that. It is a lot like us with all of our um, weights attached to us and all of our sin and all of our idols. And God is still using us in our little jail cells and God is Mm. still using us while we're crutching, Mm -hmm. clutching our little idols. And he is a king. Unlike any other, he, he makes a covenant with the people that even when they go astray, he will remain faithful. You wouldn't, you've never seen this from another king. Other Kings are using their subjects for power. They're using them for labor. They're, they have slaves. They, you don't want a relationship with their slaves. They are using them to build their kingdom and their mm-hmm. name. Then you have this Jesus who is flipping the kingdom upside down and is saying, I want an intimate relationship with my people. And I want an intimate relationship with Maggie who's on drugs. And, and I, I, the spirit of the living God lives in her body and she embodies me even when, even when, We all do that. This king comes down. This is Christmas, you guys. This is what we celebrate. The king comes down. He he becomes a human. How lowly. He he comes in flesh through birth, a messy birth is so messy. And and through a teenager and 
as a nothing and nobody. And he humbles himself and comes down. And this is the kingdom he is building. It is humble. He is with you. He wants your good. He is intimately concerned about the details of your life. He cares. Oh, lost a headphone. <laughs> I was preaching and then it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's unlike, he is unlike any other king that you have ever experienced. He is a good king. It's hard for us to believe it because we've seen so many, so many bad kings. We've seen mm. so many bad politicians. We've seen so many bad leaders and he is unlike any other saying, yeah. And in, despite your waywardness, I want to be with you. Mm. That is just, that is love came down. I mean, that is Christmas. That is cr the Christmas the depth of the Christmas message right there. Jamie, there's one question I have to ask, and that is navigating kids during a grief season. Can you just speak to that as kind of our mm -hmm. final question today? Because I do feel like that's really important for us to talk about because I think people don't know how to hold those things of how do you still be a mom and create Christmas, so to speak, as the Christmas magic maker for your kids, yeah. but then also navigate your, be authentic to your own personal journey and also the journey they may be walking. Right. Listen, I, I think my family is all kinds of crazy. I grew up with seven siblings. So there's like 10 of us in our family and we're from Texas and we do what we want, but <laughs> it's wild. Okay. But for all of its imperfections, one thing that was good about our family and still is, is you communicate and you talk it out and you talk it through. And even if it's difficult, you, there is something so powerful in bringing your kids into your own grief. And this is, would be age appropriate. Obviously there is something we, we validate their own grief when we talk about our grief mom is having a sad day, you know, when you just get sad about it, whatever it is. And I'm having a hard time. So if I feel a little extra sad, it's not because of you guys. And it's not because I don't want to celebrate the holidays. It's just, I just am having a sad day. So I think communicating that is just so key. I, I, I think my kids were a blessing during that time because they pulled me out of my inward uh, grief can just suck you inward. And there is mm -hmm. something very powerful about going outward. Um, I can sometimes do this when you feel like, Oh, like kind of that darkness is creeping in like a little depression or, you know, especially in the winter. Um, I will immediately, I got to go volunteer. I got to go run around and run some errands for a friend. I, I got to get outside of this mm -hmm. shell. And I think my kids help me um, to focus on something other than myself and my mm -hmm. sorrow. So, I mean, even if it feels like you are going through the steps and like, maybe you're not as happy mm -hmm. about going to see the lights, there is something about still going to see the lights that is helpful. And I'm telling you, the more you do that, the less that Thing, I don't know, is a marker of sadness, it will become a marker of joy. And mm -hmm. I, it's just by repetition. It sounds that sounds so boring. I feel like my answer is so boring. <laughs> but it is still do the things like still maybe you're not going to do as much and that is okay. But pick a couple things that you can that can help you look outward. And another thing that's kind of practical that helped me is create a new tradition. Like mm -hmm. if all these things are kind of making you feel sad or bringing up memories or whatever, it's not the same without this person or whatever it is, get, grab, take courage, take some courage and, and make a new tradition. What is something mm -hmm. that you wanted to do with the kids and, and make something brand new. And it just, it might surprise you, mm -hmm. um, that that new thing can bring joy. Mm -hmm. I love the embodied piece of that, that sometimes we just need to get our body mm -hmm. moving because right. we're so, we're so internal in that sadness and grief. And, and sometimes our, we just need to like, okay, one foot in front of the other, we are walking to see the lights. We are whatever we are rolling out the dough, like getting that embodied yep. movement going feels really important in that. 
Well, Jamie, yeah. this has been so helpful. Thank you. And I've got your book right here. Um, <sighs> this must be the place. It's fantastic. Why don't you tell everyone just a little snapshot of your book? Yeah, I, it is a bunch of weird stories about my life. I have a colorful life. So if you want to laugh and cry, or you just want to listen to good stories, they're great. But I more wrote the book because I, um, I think in motherhood, I got a little lost along the way and in finding my identity and kind of wifing and parenting. And um, I just didn't know who I was. And so mm. these are, this is a book of essays where I go first, I tell you the story first, but then I ask you some questions. And I think because the cover is pink and like, it's a party, colorful, <laughs> um, people are like, these are going to be like, what's your favorite color? No, <laughs> people have reviewed and we're like oh I did not expect to go to the therapy on this one but here we are um they're just deep questions that invite you to ask and look a little bit deeper inside of you because we know a lot about other people don't we we know a lot about our kids we know a lot about our spouse we know a lot about the Kardashians but we don't really know who we are so mm -hmm. this is just a giant permission slip for you to be who God made you to be like I hate to say it, it sounds cliche, but unapologetically, it is a magical way to live. So mm -hmm. um, I, it, it's kind of like a guide to help you kind of inch your way back to like, okay, who am I? Who am I in mm -hmm. Christ? And who am I embodied in this person, in this unique person? Mm -hmm. I love it so much. Well, this would be a great Christmas gift for yourself, listeners. So check it out. Jamie, Merry Christmas. I hope you have such a great holiday with your family. Merry Christmas, you guys.